This is an interview for the Purdue University Archives Oral History Program. Today's date is September 13th, 2019. The interviewee is Mark K. Craig. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Associate Head of Purdue Archives Special Collections and Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration. Mark, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. You're welcome. And to participate in this program. We're very honored. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing it. It's very important. So my first question, Mark, is sort of basic, but um, what per Purdue degree do you have, and why did you decide to come to Purdue University? Okay, I have a BS in aeronautical and astronautical engineering, really in astronautical engineering. Uh, in January of 1971, I was a co-op student. Uh, so I was in the class of 70 because I was a co-op, it took a semester longer. So. Okay. Why I chose, I came to Purdue. Uh, I'm from Midland, Texas. Uh, my family, many members of my family are from the Midwest. I was actually born in St. Louis. I have an uncle that came here, and he always was very influential in my choices. I applied to several schools. Uh, Princeton, I want to do engineering. I want to do space, because I'd seen the Sputnik when I was a kid. My dad had woken me up to see Mercury and Gemini launches. I wanted to be an archaeologist at first, uh, but that changed, uh, caught the space bug. So now I wound up going to engineering. Um, applied to Princeton, didn't get in. Applied to Duke, got in. Applied to Rice, got in provisionally. Applied to Purdue, got in. And my uncle, I think, influenced me. He said, you know, Purdue's a pretty good school. Being from the Midwest, uh, which I was and had a lot of family here, decided Purdue. It wasn't even a real choice. So I'm glad, and I've always been very glad I came here. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you talk about any mentors that you had here at Purdue, any professors mm -hmm. that really stood out and sort of helped you? One in particular, uh, Professor J.R. Uh, Osborne, who uh, uh, was a professor in mechanical engineering when I was here, taught propulsion and thermodynamics, an amazing teacher, uh, always injected humor into things. Uh, drove Corvettes on the weekend, took his students out for beer, a uh, real character. Uh, for example, he gave us, we were in a class studying trajectories, he'd give us a latitude and longitude, ask us to compute a trajectory, and the latitude and longitude would be, for example, the launch site, uh, Salt Lake City, and the impact site, Rome, which had certainly implications. <laughs> so he'd always find ways to make things funny and interesting. He and I became good friends over time, kept up a relationship uh, when after I graduated for years and years. Uh, a really fine, funny man. Uh, taught me a lot about a lot of different subjects. Taught me to find interest in learning, mm -hmm. which is very important, and how to have fun in doing it. Not take oneself too seriously, which is very important. That's very important. Uh, Dr. Art Ranger also is a professor here that uh, in Arrow, uh, taught uh, here and was a very influential, good friend over time. Kept up with him also. He moved to Charlevoix, Michigan. Uh, near where my family has a house in Lake Michigan, so uh, kept up with him also. So I'd say those are the two here at Purdue that were very influential. Well, many others were too. Professor Carnino, the co-op coordinator, uh, really helped me get into NASA, I think. Uh, very supportive of that. Helped me meet Neil Armstrong, uh, so I'd add him to the list too. But everyone here was just exceptional. And I knew it at the time. No, looking back on it, I know it even more so. Did you have a favorite, a couple of favorite courses at Purdue, or were they all just really hard? Or? Well, I'm not sure favorite. I some I enjoyed more than others, but I'm not sure I'd say they're just outstanding favorites. Dr. Osborne's was one of my favorites. Uh, his uh, systems classes, trajectories, and things. Um, no, mm -hmm. they. I really I saw the importance of all of them. I thought I was learning what I needed to learn. Assumed I was, mm -hmm. and felt good about it. So no. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say are maybe some of your fondest memories of being your years here at Purdue on campus? Well, as a co-op student, it was kind of a different experience, I think, for most, because I was here for my freshman year and then here every other, every other semester afterward. Got married my senior year and came back and lived in married student housing uh, for a year. So kind of different bookend years and a middle year that wasn't really involved too much. Uh, I was a member of Triangle Fraternity, which is very important to me. These are great, great friends that uh, supported me over time at Purdue, uh, shared like values, shared like work habits, and uh, we were good friends at the time. Um, 
one of the things I guess that I remember here coincidentally was uh, a lot of the people I met here I then knew later in life at NASA and other places. Uh, Charlie Walker being one who was an astronaut. Uh, Charlie and I were on the same design team, senior design team, and we had, I don't remember how we got on or whatever. We had a meeting and trying to come up with ideas for design projects. This was in 70, I guess, 69, 70. And uh, I suggested a space shuttle, which they had never heard of. I was working on it at the time at NASA, so I had all the plans and everything else. So being very smart, uh, opportunistic people, they said, let's do that. So we, we did a shuttle design. Uh, and Charlie and I became fairly good friends in that. Didn't see him again until one day at NASA. I was walking into a building. There was Charlie Walker. Turns out uh, he had just been uh, not selected. He was working for McDonald Douglas at the time on an experiment, and he would just been uh, approved to join the team and take it into orbit. So he and I had a nice reunion and been good friends ever since. So that's kind of a curious uh, other folks, I kind of remember my classes, uh, there were a lot of Air Force guys here uh, from the academy after their senior year that came here for seniors or master's program stuff. A lot of them were in my classes. I remember them vaguely. Uh, so it's kind of a, it, I knew it at the time, but it, looking back on it, there were a lot of people that I'd run into again later. And of course, the many people I didn't know here who went to Purdue are very important to me, that uh, Bill Gerstenmeyer, Mark Geyer, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Ross, of course. Jerry and I are the same age. I think we were in one class under Dr. Osborne together, but mm -hmm. I don't remember for sure. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to have connections at the time and then connections over time looking back on it. Right. So I, I read that uh, you took Russian here at Purdue. I did. So what did, did a faculty <laughs> member push you to do that? Because I know some of the faculty members were, no. you know. Uh, this is this is this thing. It makes me sound like a bloody genius. I was not. <clears throat> I had a, a uh, an opening for an elective and my thought process, you know, the, the Soviets have a space for them. We have a, someday we'll probably work together. That was my simple thought process. Of course, it ended up being true. That makes sense. And uh, did it, it actually ended up saving my career with NASA because I was, as said, I was fired being the last person hired in Houston on the Apollo program. Uh, given a termination date. A week before the termination date, I got another letter saying, forget it, you're now not terminated. And it's because Apollo Soyuz has just been approved not to take in Russian at Purdue. So it ended up very drastically changing my career path based on a pure fluke of my, hey, it kind of makes sense, and did it. But it's one of those things is one looks back over many years again of career path and changes and decisions made that are just kind of breathtaking. You go, really? <laughs> so it's fascinating. Well, it seems logical. It was yeah. a logical decision that you made. As a 19, 20 year old kid, yeah. 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 And it ended up being correct and, and uh, made a difference. Yeah. In fact, being assigned to Apollo Soyuz was really important because uh, I was really kind of mad about it, frankly, because I was working very heavily on shuttle at that time, and we were coming up with a shuttle design. And I was at the center of that because I, another guy and I ran the big program that integrated all the performance with the sizing stuff. So we were right at the center of all the studies on shuttle. It's configuration, which is very dynamic at that time. Mm -hmm. And to have to leave it to go work on another division on another project was very frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. Got over there. Uh, that was a fascinating adventure to work with the Soviets because they didn't want to work with us. We, as most part, didn't want to work with them either. And having grown up in an era when uh, Soviets were, when you had air raid drills every Friday afternoon, got into your desk and sirens and stuff. Uh, working with them was a little strange. They thought working with us was very strange. Uh, it was one of the best experiences of my life, however. Working with them, uh, made some very good friends with them, uh, some that I still have. Mm -hmm. uh, opened my eyes to how, the, how a shared passion can really overcome many, many differences of culture. Many, many differences. Mm -hmm. And it has. And it has continued to do that. And space is that kind of a passion which has led me to believe over time, and because I've worked on it again later with, with uh, internationals on space station, how important international cooperation is, and it's tremendous potential. Mm -hmm. You have to find a common shared passion and overcome many, many differences. Mm -hmm. And shared passion in solving really complex technical problems is wonderful because it's a great example to others. If we can solve this technical problem, we can solve others too. Why can't we? Right. And I have many examples over time where I've seen that work in other nations. I've seen it work with Russia too. Uh, where when our countries would have real loggerheads years later, uh, I was told by several of the Russians that they had actually gone to the leader of the country and said, we've got to keep working with the U.S. It's important. 
and the internal relationships we had with them are what saved our relation, our American relationship with Russia. And there's with us. Mm-hmm. Very powerful. Mm-hmm. And, and working on Apollo Soyuz did that for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Opened my eyes to it. Because I'd taken this Russian course of Purdue. <laughs> Fluke. <laughs> It all worked out. It all did, <laughs> as everything does, actually. Whether you see it at the time or not, it's right. the key. Right. Um, yeah. um, following your freshman year, in 67, you began to work at NASA mm-hmm. in the, as a co-op. And then you'd go back every other semester, yes, right. as you said. Um, could you talk a little bit about the projects you were assigned to as a co-op and what it was like being a young Purdue student at NASA at that time, okay. at that critical time sure. for NASA? Well, to start at uh, May or June of 67 was right after the Apollo 1 fire. So it was a very dynamic time, which I, of course, sensed. Mm-hmm. Didn't realize how dynamic it was until looking back on it. Uh, my first assignment there was to design a ladder that was nine feet wide, curiously, uh, as a training aid because they were, the hatch was being redesigned in the Apollo capsule because of the uh, fire. And uh, work was going to be done in the neutral buoyancy facility at that time, which is a small tank in Building 5, no longer exists. And I was told that the, uh, the divers needed a way to get an astronaut in trouble out of the tank uh, so that be an astronaut in the middle and a diver on each side taking them up, so they need a ladder nine feet wide. So I designed a ladder nine feet wide and 27 feet long or something. And did it, and it was built, I think. And uh, that was my contribution to the Apollo program. But it was in the middle of a lot of discussion about the hatch and Mm-hmm. You know, all the, what are we going to do about it, which were just fascinating. Yeah, so you were there. You could yeah, feel the energy and mm-hmm. tension and urgency. Right. Uh, the next semester, I was assigned another, in another division uh, to do, of all things, intro trajectories to the planet Venus. Uh, the Mariner 5, U.S. Mariner 5, and a Soviet Venera 4 spacecraft had just returned data on the Venus atmosphere. And... Someone in NASA in our division, which did trajectories and guidance system stuff, wanted to know, well, what does that mean if we want to do a manned mission or an unmanned mission to planet Venus? How would you do it? So I was given a set of a trajectory, a trajectory program and asked to run a kind of a parametric study of the entry angles and velocities and, and, and guidance approaches for a manned and unmanned missions to planet Venus, which ended up uh, resulting in a NASA TN, which is a big deal at that time, which is uh, authored by me, a co-op student. And another guy. A NASA TN? Technical note. TN, yeah, TN. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, that was fun. Re- got uh, a lot of experience in running big program. We ran a program on GE Mass, which is kind of the standard uh, trajectory program at the time we used. Uh, also, uh, was asked to help an engineer on a study of a hypothetical lunar flying vehicle. Uh, thinking you're on the moon, we want to be more mobile, which, of course, mm-hmm. the rover did on the moon. But uh, they're looking at flying vehicles. So and then another engineer and I did a study of qualities of a flying vehicle on the moon. So and that ended up in a in a technical note, not a technical note, but some kind of technical memorandum or something. So uh, that was very exciting. That was the year 1968 because mm-hmm. I was there most of 68, the spring of 68 and fall of 68. Uh, it was an amazing time in America at that time. Of course, a lot happening. Uh, life was really good for me at that time because my high school sweetheart was going to the University of Texas in Austin, which was a, uh, shall I say, hotbed for activity. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I would I would spend all week at NASA and on Friday night drive to Austin, have the Austin experience with my girlfriend, drive back Sunday night and have the NASA experience at JSC, or MSC at that time. Boy, best of both worlds. It was, it was quite a world. Uh, so you didn't miss the 60s. You were there. Uh, part <laughs> of it anyway. You didn't work the whole time. In fact, uh, the funny story was uh, I was called into the head of security one time, at that, in that time, and uh, he said, son, I hear you're going to Austin a lot. And I said, my first thought was, how the hell do you know? None of your damn business. And what he said was, I don't know about what you're doing there, but if you ever do drugs, I'm going to kill you. Revoke your security clearance, you're out of here. I never was doing drugs anyway, but I was. It was curious that the environment at that time it yeah. got that attention and uh, was told that. So I didn't affect my behavior because I wouldn't do it anyway. Like I say, but Austin was an amazing place at that time. We'd go here Willie Nelson, you know, on Saturday nights, and yeah. and uh, the fraternity and sorority scene at Austin was a lot different than here. Uh-huh. Put it that way. My girlfriend was a pie fi there, and and uh, there was no triangle chapter there, so I didn't have that to go. But 
it was a great day. Same with high school friends, and it was a wonderful time, both working at NASA and being uh, in Austin. So okay. six days, one of my favorite years. It's like being at home. It yeah, was it was. Home. It was home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> became home, for sure. Yeah. yeah. That was 68. Then in 69... I got another assignment, still an engineering uh, division and engineering division, same one actually where I'd done the Venus studies. I was assigned to work on uh, the the team uh, beginning to design space shuttle. So before we landed on the moon, I was working on space shuttle design. Uh, engineer named Max Roger, who was the head of engineering in Houston, had come up with a concept for that and was having us explore it. And what was his name? Max Faget, F A G E T, mm-hmm. Maxime Faget a legend at NASA. Uh, he held the patent on the Mercury and Gemini capsules, the Apollo, kind of a legend engineer. And really an interesting guy. Uh, so working for him, I'm not sure why they selected me. Perhaps I was the biggest guy and we had to carry so many card decks to get all the data over to the computer center. <laughs> Couldn't afford to drop them either. But I really enjoyed that. It was a great chance to see how things came together because I was, I ran the uh, integration program which had been uh, bought from General Dynamics of how you, so I say, you, you have certain routines that size the system, you know, how much it weighs, et cetera, based on wing weight and things. And then it would run a trajectory to see how much propellant needed, and that feed back into the size. So it's kind of an integrated sizing performance program, trajectories, weight. Mm-hmm. So you put in all that, and you end up with a vehicle weight and a vehicle configuration. And we ran a lot of those studies. Because they were getting a lot of headquarters attention, too, uh, you saw that God, I got insight into what the headquarters was thinking, because they'd send memos to Max, they'd give to us, well, we need to do this, need to do that, look at straight wings, delta wings, different kinds of boosters, different propulsion systems, different propellants. It's a great introduction to the complexity of spacecraft and how you put it all together. Right. And great they, introduction. And they were already transitioning to, yep. to a shuttle. Before we landed on the moon. In fact, I remember going out watching, up, looking at the moon in July, and had been working that day on a shuttle design. So That's amazing. Yeah. And necessary. I mean, shuttle's necessary. a pretty complicated system. Yeah. yeah, I don't think people realize that. Yeah, how yeah. early it started. It did. So, um, and that, that played out well in my future career as I worked on space station and other things, and worked on how you really put systems together. How mm-hmm. you how it you don't just build one and try it. I mean, you have to analytically decide how it's going to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, start with it's it's really system engineering. You start with what you're trying to do, and then deconstruct that. Okay, if you're going to do this, how much repulsion you need? How much battery do you need, how much this do you need, how much that do you need, how much is that going to cost, how much is that way, and then it feeds back into what you're going to do. So it's an iterative process that that really opened my eyes to. It mm-hmm. would serve me very well later. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, could you tell tell us, talk a little about your encounter with Neil Armstrong while you were sure. a co-op student? Yeah. It's a great story. And also Eugene Cernan. And also Eugene Cernan. Yeah. Uh, well, in, nine, in the fall of 68, I was, that was my big year at NASA, of course, as I said. Professor Carnino, who is a co-op coordinator here, had said, you know, you ought to go by and see Neil Armstrong. He was, he, he was one of my students when I was here, when he was here. And so I said, yeah, sure. I mean, at that point, Neil was, I knew kind of what he'd done on Gemini and very, very uh, well-known astronaut. So I said, yeah, sure. Uh, well, one day I happened to be in his building, walking down the hall, and there he was at his desk, just reading some papers. So I kind of screwed up my courage, took a deep breath, walked in. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, my name is Mark. How are you doing? I've been expecting you. Wow, that kind of blew me away. So he sit down. Tell me what you're up to. So I very flattered and sat down and began talking to him about what I was doing on Venus at that time, which Neil was just fascinated by. I'm not sure he was fascinated by it, but he was nice enough to say he was, ask very good questions about it. And probably 20, 30 minutes into that conversation, Gene Serenin comes in very animated and says, Neil, congratulations. And he goes, yeah, and that's nice. Meet Mark Craig, who's a Boilermaker, working on Venus. And Gene said, well, that's cool. Sits down, listens, and might continue talking about Venus. And neither one of them said why Gene had come in. So I didn't think anything about it. The next day was announced Neil was going to come in to Apollo 11. So it had just been announced to the crew office that day, that morning, that Neil was the commander of Apollo 11. And I was there in a meeting with him. <laughs> and he was spending half an hour with this kid from Purdue talking about Venus. And I, as I got to know Neil later and over many interactions with him over the years, that is pure Neil. Yeah. Very involved, very unassuming person, very interested person, mm-hmm. uh, very very nice person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I often tell people when I ask about him, uh, you know, I think if we humankind had, a, had an election to pick the first person to walk on the moon, we would have picked Neil Armstrong, hands down. Yeah, if, if people knew him yep. like that. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I kind of had a sense if he picked. I mean, it's again, like the Russian thing, it sounds kind of strange, but A, he was a civilian at that time, which I thought was important. Uh, B, he had had two really narrow escapes, one on Gemini and one on the, the uh, Lunar Lander trainer at uh, Ellington, which I knew about. So it's, and by all of course, he's just a very nice person. So I kind of thought, well, civilian, really, really talented engineer he's gotten some really tough situations out of, and um, he'll probably be the one. And sure enough, he was, which made perfect sense. So. Wow, what a coincidence that it is, you were it? there that day. Yeah, that day, walking down the hall. And, and both yeah. Purdue grads, uh -huh. yep. <laughs> all three of you in yeah. the same room. Gene and Gene, I got to know more than Neil, and I kept up yeah. when I was head of Moon Mars. Uh, I'd write him for advice or ask for his opinion on things, which he's always careful to give. And, and uh, uh, I really appreciated Neil for a lot of reasons. So many of his astronaut and other senior colleagues, they knew exactly what we should do in going to the Moon and Mars. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Down to the propulsion system, the orbit. Every time Neil and I would talk about it, he'd say, you know, I, will, I really will support whatever the nation decides it wants to do which is exactly the right answer. Mm -hmm. Don't assume it. Make sure there's a debate. Make sure the nation decides, then you'll support it. And that's what Neil did, which right. he really did. Uh, Gene uh, and I worked, in fact, the first time we worked together was a, a project for a, uh, a space potential phase, phase history center in Bremen, Germany. The government of Bremen was going to build, a, in the old German subpens, a visitor center for space. Oh, a visitor center. Uh -huh. Or some kind of a space-themed attraction. And they hired Bob Rogers, who uh, became a friend of mine, his company to do that. And, they, and Gene hired, or Bob hired Gene also. So he and I went up to California together and got to know each other during that and then kept up with each other. Of course, both living in Houston, both Purdue grads. Uh, right. Gene and I had a number of conversations over the years, which I really appreciated. Mainly about, I'd ask him, you know, what was it like to be on the moon? He'd, his, his, mesh, his talking about what he thought and what he felt on the moon were very important to me over the years because they changed, uh -huh. and uh, and he really thought and felt not just thought he felt he. One thing that really impressed me about Gene, he said, you know, Mark, uh, I decided early on when I'm on the moon, I'm going to be very busy with all this stuff. I'm going to take some time out just to stop, and look and feel. That in itself told me what a special person he was because he and he did. And then he shared what he stopped and felt. So. Mm -hmm. To do that in that kind of situation, being a quintessential engineer and pilot is very special, and Gene was very special. Mm -hmm. So to have those two men as both in that meeting initially and then over the years become friends and colleagues and advisors, what a gift, and yeah. fellow Boilermakers to boot. <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, <laughs> when Purdue played Rice University, we lived near Rice University, mm -hmm. a couple of blocks away, and Purdue played Rice, we invited Gene and Franz Cordova and several people over to our house for food after the game. We Purdue lost, and Gene was just fit to be tied. That's the worst coach of a game I've ever seen. I threw his hat down to Chris and get out of here. So it was funny. But yeah, he had passion. I, he did have a lot of passion. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate too. Yeah, did you? To know Mr. Sir. Mm -hmm. He loved the archives. And, yeah, I bet. And was so supportive. Yeah, and well, talked to our students when he came and. I think, in fact, Gene was the one that first told me about the archives because yeah. he knew I'd done all these. He said, Mark, are you in the archives? I said, no, what, what archives? He told me about what Baron Hilton and what he'd done with that. And I said, man, I'll, I'll do it. So he's yeah. the one that told me about you all and convinced me. It didn't convince, didn't take any convincing, but. Yeah. So yeah. be thankful yeah. for that. Too. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. He's a true friend of Purdue. Yeah. In many he is. ways. In many, many ways. Yeah. yeah. Yep. We were very fortunate. Okay, so here's a little surprise. Uh -oh. I've got the Purdue Engineer from 1968. So uh -oh. the article. <laughs> and I just Oh, and the testing? Here's your article. You're a young student and undergraduate. I think this is just after yeah. your, huh. your freshman year. Gee. So my, um, you know, we're talk, we talk about undergraduate research mm -hmm. here at Purdue now. And how did you find the time to... to uh, write and who did, did someone encourage you to, to put this article together you know I don't uh, I saw that as I put my list of publications together it's probably my first publication it is it's your first publication very first one and being an archivist yeah. I went right to the sure. first so I was so impressed and it's not in stone and not in modern papyrus <laughs> but anyway, um, I just wanted to show yeah, you that yeah it's neat um, I really don't remember no one encouraged me well maybe Professor Carnito encouraged me to write it up because I wouldn't have done that 
normally. Yeah. Why I was working on this, I really don't remember. I think it was the thing I was kind of given a short term to analyze some of the numbers in here or something. And so Professor, well, I was telling Professor Carney, I wrote it up probably as a co-op, you know, report for the end of the semester. He said, well, would you write this up for the engineer? I'll bet. Ah, so but you, I, had to, you had to produce a report at the end of each yes, co-op. Yes, we sure did, yeah. What we'd done, yeah. Kept it. That's the only reason I can. That's the only reason I can think of. Yeah. This would end up with engineer Professor Carnino said, "Well, nice, write it up or something." Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 really mm -hmm. really kind of cool. So got some interesting diagrams. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Well. Uh, Explanation and it's very well written. I should say. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Huh. Wow. <laughs> interesting. Hmm. Um, so my next question is, is somewhat broad, but I guess we'll keep it. Um, the question is, uh, where did your degree from Purdue take you upon graduation? So okay. right from graduation. <clears throat> well, it took me to being fired from NASA first. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the degree, as the timing. Right. So I think uh, we have to talk about that a little bit. We talked earlier. But uh -huh. Well, because I graduated in January of 71, having been a co-op instead of June of 70, which would normally uh, was right at the end of the Apollo program. It was canceled within months of my graduation, the Apollo program. And then the, at that time, the strategy was last hired, first fired in the government. So I was given a notice, uh, I don't remember what month, but given a notice, you're going to be laid off. NASA did a lot to find a place for me for TRW and other companies, so they were working to find a place for me. Um, I then got a notice uh, two weeks or a week before I was going to my termination date that was you revoked. And I, both those letters in the archive, I think, both my letter, you're terminated, my letter, forget it, you're not terminated, they're in the archive. Um, because I'd taken Russian to Purdue and Apollo Soyuz had just been approved. I bet you no one way they, NASA worked. They, uh, NASA, uh, kind of the hidden figure, ladies. Mm -hmm. There were some women in NASA who really ran things, and some of the women in human resources were incredible, and they were really looked on to, I bet you they were told, find a way to keep this guy. And at first they couldn't, but then when ASTP was approved, they could. So they found a way and got the word out really good. I'm guessing probably that that's what happened, but mm -hmm. otherwise it wouldn't have happened. I mean, the engineers didn't know I'd taken Russia or anything, so it had to been a woman in HR that kind of... Right, then she knew your yeah, file. Yeah, knew my file. She'd been kind of, see if you can find a way to keep this guy, I hope. Mm -hmm. And she did, finally, and yep. Got the head of HR, and he sent me a letter saying, forget it. Um, so that's, I think, broadly, uh, it's hard to say broadly, because Purdue taught me so many different things about the expansiveness of the enterprise, the different dimensions to it, the interconnectedness of it, uh, all those things, which have played out in my career all the way through it up to today. Understanding why you're doing things. Don't just do them, but understand, understand the context for things. Uh, I've, one of the lessons I've learned uh, looking back on it was the importance of understanding the context. If I'm given a job for anything, a bolt, it doesn't matter. What's going on above the bolt, below the bolt, to the left of the bolt, and the right of the bolt? It's not my job explicitly, but I'll learn so much more about doing the bolt better by knowing its context. And it'll, it'll help me grow as an engineer to understand that too. I think some of that came from the early experiences with the programs I was talking about, like the shuttle sizing program. Mm -hmm. where you began to see, you know, yeah, propulsion systems are nice, but they exist for a reason. What is it? And how do you characterize them? And how does that then affect the aero system? How does that affect the landing gear? Does that affect the, it's all affected together. Right, the whole Yep, system. and if you don't solve the whole problem, you're not solving any of it. In fact, you're not, you're avoiding solving the whole problem if you don't see the relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Purdue certainly prepared me for that, made me open to it, but then NASA, with that experience and others, really helped me see the power of that. Very important. And it's now, I mean, it's, that's kind of the theme of my career, I think. Uh, the policy dimension is so important, too. It's just another part of the context. Yeah, it is. Yep, it's another part of the context, a very important part. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the top level why. Mm -hmm. As engineers, you know, we love rockets, we love systems, we love all this stuff. But if you don't get the why right, the rest of it really doesn't matter, which we don't like to hear. That's why destinations, you know, that's, that's not, what's the why? Just to get there? No. There's got to be a why if it's going to work. Getting to Mars, why? Just to get there, you know, that's not a good enough reason. Let's make it sustainable. Right. So the interconnectivity and context of things and the why, 
differentiating between means and, means and ends is really important, the why, and then operationalizing that. How do you really reflect that in the system is really important in everything, in, in, not just engineering, but in life too, I think. Mm -hmm. so. um, while we're sort of talking about your, your early mm -hmm. career, um, it was striking that uh, you were on the startup teams for several programs, yeah. Space Show, Space Station, Lunar Mars Space Exploration Initiative. Why do you think that you were chosen to be on these startup teams, or, or what attracted you to these, um, to to these these phases of these programs? Well, it's one thing. It's it's a it's a real. It's I know of no one else that was on the startup team for all three, mm -hmm. for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So much just fluke. Shuttle. I think I was on the startup team because I was available, and like I said, I was the biggest guy to carry the computer deck, maybe. And I think I'm fairly good at trying to see big picture and and try to be articulate. I think that was part of it too. Uh, for the shuttle in 1969, for space station, uh, was in '83, '84. Uh, the shuttle had begun flying. I'd been the the subsystem manager for the staging system and several other things, but mainly the staging system. It was clear that was coming to an end. So I was wondering, what am I going to do next? So I actually went to the head of the space station, the embryonic space station, and said, "You need somebody to help." I was looking to the next. And that was just before a skunk works basically was set up in NASA headquarters. So, yeah, we need, you want to do a headquarters? Yeah, well, we need you up there. So I ended up going to headquarters, was the lead uh, JSE engineer up there on that. So that got me in the space station. Uh, Moon Mars uh, actually is a, a stranger story in a way. Uh, space station, we got it going. Then after the Challenger accident, NASA made a decision to move its management to Washington out of Houston which I thought was a huge mistake. But managing the program office, what was this level two in shuttle? Um, NASA had concluded that a lead, based on challenge, a lead, so-called lead center concept was not appropriate. A center shouldn't run a, a, the integration of an enterprise, a headquarters should do it. Uh, so the, through a fairly contentious process, they decided to move it to Washington, to a shopping center in Maryland. I mean, in Virginia, rest of Virginia. Well, I say shopping center because that, as stupid as it sounds, that's how stupid it was. Create a, a, integrating a very comp complicated technical enterprise like a space station with just a bunch of people showing up at a shopping center without a center as a home to draw on resource, they have infrastructure, they have culture and everything else, mm -hmm. was just nuts to me, just stupid. Mm -hmm. I still think it was, and it proved to be so, I think, in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, but their feeling was they thought it can't be at a NASA center. It needs to be near headquarters, which is another mistake because top-level integration is good at a political level, but tech, detailed technical integration, I knew how complicated that was. That just wasn't going to work, again, in a shopping center in Virginia near Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So I refused. I was the head of engineering on the space station at that point, and they just refused to go. Um, so that left me kind of afloat in Houston, having been a senior engineer there, and I think well-respected and liked by the mm -hmm. center director and Cohen. Uh, so he, he uh, put me at first back in the engineering director's, kind of the engineering director's contact for the shuttle program, which I did for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. But then he and others began to think, well, what do we do with Moon Mars? Just as kind of what's next? Uh, so he had some, uh, put together a team of folks to begin looking at that and decided, well, let's put Craig the head of that. So it made me the head of that, just looking at JSC and Moon Mars stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that was about the time that uh, for various reasons, the Bush administration came along. They wanted to start looking at something next also. And uh, headquarters wanted to realize they needed to start looking at it across the agency, not just, although JSC were trying to do that. Uh, they put together the headquarters to really look across, do an integrated study across the agency. Uh, and I was ultimately selected, and I supported that when I was head of the JSC program, but then was asked to go overrun it too when Frank Martin left and John Aaron. So then went to headquarters as the AA for that, and then from that and the work of JSC, when the Bush administration got really serious about it, led that for the for the agency for the administration. So, again, kind of looking what's next, uh, got me into space station. Space station went away through a bad decision, in my view. Well, what's next? Moon Mars, that made sense. So, ended up as a startup of that. That I know no one else that has had that experience, which is good or bad. Uh, but it's unique. And again, it, it helped me understand how things work. And now, because as I understood how things work technically, I think they should be integrated 
in space station, begin to see how things could work politically to be integrated. But on Moon Mars, I really saw they should be, should be or couldn't be integrated politically. Um, so kind of an expanding sphere of understanding on my part and interest and dedication to finding ways to help the enterprise led to all three. So at, at, each, at each of those, you probably became more and more sort of an administrator or, or a higher level, bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Well, in space station, certainly, uh, because there, when I was the head of engine system engineering on space station, I was the chief at level two, which means integrating the different elements of space station and the international partners at that point. Uh, so I, as that, I was involved in the international negotiations with Japan, Europe, and Canada, which is fascinating and a good way to learn, too. So integrating things at that level, first there was big programs in, I mean, the integration program in shuttle. Uh, and then integrating the booster staging system, which was kind of tough because it was a, well, the boosters were Marshall and everything else was JSC, the orbiter and the control system. So I would like to think I was selected for that because I was good at working across boundaries. And uh, that was a tough boundary. I didn't see it at the time, but between Marshall and JSC, there were a lot of different cultures and other things. Marshall didn't trust me at all because I worked for JSC. And so. Oh, that's interesting. It, uh, Ended up I, looking back on it. I'm glad I did because I think I was very good at it. But I was thinking people valued my ability to work across organizations and appreciate them, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which I did on shuttle. And then space station ended up being a level two integrator, so of system engineering, which is the person that runs the process and really does the integration to come up with the configuration. Uh, so mm -hmm. that was a big deal, mm -hmm. and very a lot of a lot of. Uh, a lot of aspects to integrating a space station, obviously. International, scientific, user and dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I saw how that worked and didn't work. That was very important. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, on the space station, it's, a, it's an interesting experience because the reason you have a space station is to use it for something, but they never could figure out what the use was, in my view, the Washington, the political people. So they, mm -hmm. and the reason they couldn't, in my view, is because they didn't want to, they didn't want to lose any potential advocates politically. So it will be everything to everybody. Well, can't be. And as, as the engineer trying to put the thing together, I kept saying, what is it supposed to do? Well, you'll figure it out. Well, no. I mean, I can figure it out. It'll cost a trillion dollars, not do anything. But what is it? And they never could answer that, which always, they said, we're sorry, but we just can't. And I, okay, I got that. I understand why, but that's tough. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my first integration. I got into politics. And then Moon Mars, it was really even worse because uh, the Bush administration was very interested in doing this. Didn't have support in Congress, really. And uh, old dynamic was playing it. That was the end of the Soviet Union. So Star Wars was beginning to dissolve politically. They saw it as an existential threat. So they were trying to get into, I think, Space Exploration Initiative, SEI, not SDI, mm -hmm. to, uh, in my view, uh, civilianized weapons in a way. I kept telling the administrator that, and nah, can't be true. Edward Teller would show up at our meetings all the time, which I found a different experience. I think it's in my notes. Uh, the father of the hydrogen bomb wanders in and out of meetings at the White House, listens, doesn't say anything, leaves, comes back with a bunch of, well, he doesn't, but his people come back with a bunch of ideas. You go, know, really? Hmm. Then a book came out a couple years after that, written by Bill Broad, called The Teller's War, about how he had, uh, through hyperbole and basically falsifying test results, a dry lab Star Wars in a lot of ways. And I, let me see what he probably was doing there. So that was a very different experience. Um, again, I learned from it, I hope. Mm -hmm. They're very different. Uh, so integrating things at different levels, different types mm -hmm. of things in different uh, ways, uh, successfully, sometimes not successfully, as for a very learning experience mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, so the first space shuttle flight took mm -hmm. place in 1981, right. and then eight years ago, 2011, mm -hmm. the last <coughs> flight. Um, you started out right from the beginning yeah. with the shuttle program, um, and people don't realize, you know, I think that, that it started right in 1969. Yeah. Um, can you talk about um, a little bit more about that early work on the shuttle program? And also, and because we've already talked about this a little bit, the winding down of the program. Mm -hmm. you, you, you experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that, both professionally and personally? Sure. Well, the startup of the program I was very involved in because I was doing the integration work with different elements to come up with a configuration and then was given the responsibility for the management of the staging system, which is very important and very difficult. 
very mm-hmm. most staging system you know the cylinder pulls away <laughs> that's mm-hmm. it shuttle the booster's got to go out there under the wings it's very high high dynamic pressure uh, different kind of system so I really enjoyed working on that um, and you saw the first launch no I didn't, oh, I, didn't. my parents saw the first launch oh. I was in Mish Control in Houston the first launch uh, then on the first launch, there was d- damage to the orbiter tiles, and I was asked by the program manager to put together a team to assess what caused the damage because those were the heat protection tiles in the orbiter were obviously very important. There was some fairly significant damage, and no one knew what caused it, so it had to be fixed before you fly it again for sure. Uh, because of my staging work, we had separation motors, solid rocket motors that blew the boosters away, so we'd done a lot of work of characterizing the effect of the flow field on tiles and the damage to tiles from that. So I was one of the few people who really understood or thought I understood damage to tiles at that point. So I think that's why he asked me to do it. Um, that led me into then putting together a team, which one of my great experiences was going out and inspect the shuttle right before launch, uh, which was great fun to walk around a loaded launch vehicle, walk under it, dripping water all over you because of condensation. Uh, flat deck, you're afraid you're going to walk off of it, look up, walk off, you know. Uh, the valves are going off like shotguns, boom, 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 all around you, breaking your ears. Uh, there's a giant flame pond where the excess hydrogen is burned off, big yellow flames coming up beside the vehicle. It's very Wagnerian, kind of operatic. You go, wow, this is different and wonderful. So did that, and then we got that the damage figured out and moved on to the space station, actually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've done, done a number of different things on the shuttle program getting it started. Later in the program, I actually then uh, was involved in what was called Service Life Extension Program, which uh, NASA was trying to figure out, okay, how do we continue to maintain the program, you know, just logistically and else mm-hmm. Did that for a couple of years out of Houston um, after the Moon Mars uh, program. So, yeah, I've been involved in it a long time at different points. Um, one of the challenges, another challenge I'd recognized early on with human spaceflight, the programs, the unit, I'll call them the units of reality, the programs are so big it's hard to do the next one until you get rid of the first one. That's a challenge. So big, uh, costly in terms of resources. And yep, man- money, manpower, everything. I mean, they're, they're, the unit of reality for a shuttle is huge right. in every sense. Political, mm-hmm. monetary, fiscal, human resource, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Huge. So to go to the next program, we started to wrestle with that in SEI. What do you do? You just can it? Do you morph it over time gradually? What do you do? Um, the decision was made for various reasons to just can it, go to the next, which I'm not sure I agree with, but I'm not sure I disagree with either because uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I knew it was going to happen once it became clear what that trade off was. I'm pretty sure it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And emotionally, that was very tough for me. Uh, my parents had seen the first shuttle launch. Uh, my, at that time, 11 year old daughter Claire went to the last shuttle launch with me. Mm-hmm. So, that was very special for Claire and I to be together at that launch. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, I actually had the badge my parents had used, so she used that badge on her. She met Bob Crippen had been on SDS-1. and wow. Yeah, it was a really neat experience. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I always will be very grateful to the shuttle for, it really did, um, I think it, we talk about a psychological highway into space. The shuttle, by going up routinely, and regularly for a very for 30 years created the expectation that space was our in our domain as human beings we could do things there productive not military I mean we could do productive things mm-hmm. you look at the number of things it took up the number of experiments the number of work the amount of work it did the space station the Hubble repairing Hubble I think it really opened our eyes as humankind to the potential of space and what could be done there mm-hmm. and how to do it mm-hmm. and certainly gave us the experience Mm-hmm. Um, you look at the number of hours spent there, the international participation on shuttle, mm-hmm. Space Lab, the international astronauts, the number of wide range of experiments, satellites taken up, brought back, fixed, repaired. It really, space is really can be a useful place and do amazing things. That It built that into our psyche, I think, as people, which is very important. Mm-hmm. Can you talk, uh, I have two follow-up yeah. questions to that. Can you talk a little bit more about that term you just used, the psychological highway mm-hmm. to space? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, we as humans uh, have expectations, have views of the world. And when I was a kid, space was not part of that. If anything, it was scary. 
In fact, we were on vacation in Detroit this summer. I went to see uh, The Thing from 1951. The Thing, yeah. It was an old theater with an organ playing. It was so cool. Oh, it was cool. Girls really loved it. I loved it. I'd, I'd never seen it before. I think I saw it when I was five, maybe, a long time ago. James Arness was The Thing. Turns out, again, folks, Matt and Dylan, you didn't know it. It was an incredible movie. Howard Hawks, I mean, the Western Howard Hawks directed it. Uh, space was kind of scary. Uh, it came, remember the movies, the giant, it came from space. That was one of them. Air, air space, all these things would show up or dangerous things. Mm-hmm. And uh, then Star Wars came along and yikes turned into, wow, there's real potential in space because of the show, I think. And and the psychological highway into space, if it's very, for positive, for humans, is very important because I think it leads to where we need to go as humanity in a lot of ways. So anything that can build the expectation of space, yes, I mean, forget governments and companies. Yes, we as a society or we as a culture, we as a country need to do this. That's an expectation. That's a psychological highway in space. And it doesn't just come through programs. I mean, it doesn't, the government just said, we're going to do this. So what I'm really trying to capture is a sense in society of culture of space. Um, Almost a mindset? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That we can. Just the expectation. We can and we should. It's just mm-hmm. part of our future. That's the psychological highway into space. Mm-hmm. Uh, engineers can't do that at all. I mean, we, the, the things we produce can lead to it, like shuttle. But but until it's actually built in, in through just the act of doing a number of things over time and conscious communication and sense of that, it's not real for me. And the fact it's really, I think the shuttle made it real for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. That's to me why the moon is so important as the next activity venue for human activity in space. Because when there are people living and working on the moon, Everyone has seen the moon. Not many people have seen space station. Not many people have seen Mars. Everyone has seen the moon. To know that there are people living and working on there, as I look up at it at night, mm-hmm. well, maybe I can live up there. Surely my grandkids or grandkids can live and work up there. Surely it's a part of our future as humanity. Mm-hmm. And that's, it. that's the psychological highway in space. It's a very powerful concept, I think. It's hard to do. We don't talk about it enough. And it, it sounds kind of cheap, I guess, if we did. We wanted to have it. But I think it's really important we do have it because that's where the politics comes from. And everything else. We need to recognize that and take it into account as we make decisions like canceling shuttles and other things. Yeah. Yep. That is, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it did. And I think it's an, it's an interesting and important concept. Yeah. I do too. That we don't yeah. think about. No. But, mm-hmm. Often because we're a technical community. And mm-hmm. That's a shame. Yeah. Because ironically, that's why a lot of us are here in the technical community. We, we are bought into the psychology of that. Right. Yeah. Um, you also brought up talking about um, about um, the space shuttle and the contribution, mm-hmm. um, international cooperation. Mm-hmm. So, um, could you talk a little bit about your work, a little bit more in depth about your work with international teams, specific, specifically the Apollo Soyuz test project and space okay, station? Sure. There's a couple interesting things in your papers, artifacts. Oh, the vodka bottle. <laughs> the vodka bottle. <coughs> yeah. is, I do bring out to show students. Good. Yeah. And show them the signatures mm-hmm. and tell us a mm-hmm. little bit of the story. Good. Yeah. I'd love to yeah. hear more sure. of the story. And then half of a, a toilet sandwich. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you don't have a, to tell no, that story. No, I'll tell you that story too. It's yeah. around Reston, Virginia. Yeah. Um, I think international cooperation is key. It's one of the powerful dimensions of space. Again, in a way, it's related to the psychological highway for humanity. Um, I began, my first international experience with space was on Apollo Soyuz, as you said, where I was a junior engineer working with uh, Soviet engineers, who at first we distrusted, me too, I guess, because I'd grown up in a generation where Soviets were evil. I mean, we had bomb shelters, air raid warnings all the time in school in third grade, etc. So to one day just start working with them, you go, wow, that's different. And uh, I think a lot of the engineers, I, NASA engineers I work with, didn't like their equipment, thought it was cheap, thought it was shoddy, thought it was immature, thought it was very sophisticated. And in talking to them, they thought the same thing about our stuff. It was the opposite. It was overblown, too much, too expensive, too complicated. So we didn't trust, and then we just didn't trust each other. But over time, as we worked together, I think what I attribute to the common passion of space really brought out. These are really smart guys. They, us, and us, them. They're committed to what I'm committed to. They really want to explore space and do it well and safely. And they boy, they know a lot of stuff. And once you get that, it changes your relationship 
once you crop over that border. Um, so the uh, the Soviets uh, became friends over time, and that's where the vodka, we had parties together and stuff, of course. And uh, curiously, the uh, yeah, I had some interesting insights too from that. The uh, one of the Soviets I became particularly close with uh, thanked me, <clears throat> was very thankful that the U.S. government created all the commercial entities around NASA, like grocery stores and shoe stores. And said, really? And what? And kind of not saying you're nuts, I said, what, what do you mean? And what he came to mean was he didn't think that was real. He thought only around NASA did the U.S. government create that so it impressed the Soviets. But it, as you go out to Keokuk, Iowa, none of that existed, grocery stores or anything. And I think it was because you walk in a grocery store that take that. There's such a variety of things. It just was unimaginable to even these very, you know, senior rocket scientists in Russia, who were at the top of the pyramid in Russia, it was unimaginable to them. So that was a real interesting insight to me about the Soviet system. Another insight I got was one of my colleagues went to Goom, the big department, the NASA colleagues went to Goom, the big department store in Russia. And he said he walked in at the men's shoe department. There were just rows and rows, thousands of shoes. I mean, just as far as the eye could see, shoes. They got to look at them. They're all the same color and all the same size and all the same style. And you got to think, well, that's probably because the people's shoe factory in Novosibirsk was given some quota for shoes. And the only way they could make that many shoes was make them all the same color, all the same size, and all the same style. So, again, kind of a contrast between our two systems. Mm -hmm. Not better, not worse, just contrast. Uh, Soviets over time would always go to Sears. That was their favorite place. They'd buy spark plugs, Levi's, everything. And by suitcase, take them all back, to, I'm sure, for their family to sell on the black market. Mm -hmm. But they were never talked about it, but it's just things you observe over time. Mm -hmm. uh, I love working with them. They have, uh, the, I found the people I had the best relationship with had a great sense of humor, very much like an American sense of humor, kind of dry, funny. Really enjoyed working with them for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first real lesson. And, you know, if you have a common passion, you can overcome all kinds of differences, and that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, my best example of that is actually Tom Stafford, who was the commander of Apollo Soyuz. Tom and his wife, Linda, when he was 71 years old, adopted two teenage Russian boys because Alexei Leonov, their Soviet commander, asked him to. Now that's a relationship. Yeah. When you can ask a 71-year-old man and his wife to adopt teenage boys, and he does it, that is a relationship. And that's the kind of relationship you have when you have a common passion and work together. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my first eye opener on that was ASTP. I had eye openers again working with uh, Europe, Japan, and Canada on the space station program. Again, found the common passion can override all kinds of differences. And I have no reason to think it won't either in the future. Mm -hmm. That's why with China and others, it's very important we do that. Now we ought to do it with our eyes open, as we did with the Soviets. Right. But do it, because its benefits are immense, just immense. If, if people can work together on very complicated projects like building a space station, weighs a million pounds, as big as a football field in orbit, and it works, what else can we solve with find a common passion on Earth? Right. Develop those relationships. Space can be a real harbinger and pathfinder mm -hmm. for all of that. Right. And very powerful, peaceful pathfinder for that. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, when asked about it by young people or others, you know, what do you think about working with different countries? I think we ought to. I really do. Because the benefits far away the it doesn't mean you shouldn't be careful, and like with the Soviets. In fact, today people, you know, China this, China that. Well, let me tell you about the Soviet Union back when I was a kid. It was pretty bad, too. Yeah. So if you deliberate and work your way through it, you can figure it out. It's better for humankind, better for your country, and better for us as individuals. We do. Mm -hmm. yeah. In space, the chance to work with people like that is just amazing. What fun. Mm -hmm. What fun. What great friends. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Thank you. Could you please talk a bit about your policy and strategic planning work later with NASA? Okay. Yeah, that was uh, kind of a follow-on on much of the rest of the stuff I've been talking about, realizing if you don't know why, you're not going to do it well, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you got to have a political, political policy basis to make things happen. Um, I got into that at NASA headquarters because... Uh, I was the AA for as space exploration, and because of, for various reasons, was not chosen to be the continuous AA. Someone from SCI was brought in for that from the outside. Jack Daly, who was basically the acting deputy administrator, associate administrator of NASA at that time, General Jack Daly, and I developed a relationship during that time, and he was putting together a strategic plan for the agency for Dan Golden, Administrator Golden. Jack and I hit it off, and uh, he asked me to, well, you don't have this Moon Mars stuff now. I was still working at JSC at the time, but coming up to headquarters every week. 
you mind coming up here and working on this? I said, sure, because I really like Jack. Uh, Marine General, head of the Marine Air Corps, really solid, good thinker. Um, I'd just been to MIT. That was another part of my exit strategy from, from uh, SEI. I asked Aaron Cohen, said, well, what can I do to help you? And he said, well, how about if I go to MIT Sloan? So I did that. That was a real opener, too. So Learning. that was graduate studies? Mm -hmm. The Sloan School Executive, major, Senior Executive Program, yeah. Kind of like an MBA, not, but kind of. Where you lived in a residence 24-7 for, you know, three or four months with other executives being having to have discussions with MIT professors, Peter Singy and others. That was a real great experience. So from that, I had a much, I think, deeper aspect of strategy and how to deal with some of the problems I've seen with NASA and its challenges. And Jack saw that, too. So I was very glad to go to work with Jack. Um, one of the first things, of course, he and I realized, you don't just come up, if it's going to work, you don't just come up with strategy and say, here it is, folks. You follow people in this development. So Jack and I came up with a plan to get all the senior management in a retreat to, and lay out a prospect and use the results of those discussions to come up with a strategy. We did that at the Kennedy Space Center beach house called where the astronauts go. So we went there a couple of times with all the senior managers. Uh, came up with a strategic plan, the, the fundamental premise of which uh, was creating what we call the strategic enterprise. It's kind of the strategic business units for NASA. Some had had, some had had not before. For example, at that time, all the human spaceflight stuff was in an office named the Office of Spaceflight. OSF, code M. Well, guess what its values were? Flying. That's it. One thing I learned at MIT was you, if to be effective, you have to understand who your external customers are and what you do for them. What business are you in? It sounds stupid, but it's really hard, really important. Mm -hmm. So when Jack and I talked about deciding, nope, that's the, that's the linchpin of what we need to do is come up with the NASA strategic business units. Some are like science, great. That's, that is a strategic business unit. Uh, Others, probably human space, especially was tougher. And that's when I came up with the human exploration and development space. That's the business that NASA should be in for human space in 1993. We did that. And then in addition to the strategic plan, you got to have a strategic management system. So you got a plan. Now, who's going to do what? How do you make it happen? So we came up with that, too, and got the ownership of the uh, – we didn't develop it. We basically facilitated the senior management developing. So did that, too. So I was very proud of those two things and Jack Daly. Um, he and I remained good. He wanted to become the head of the Air and Space Museum. He's a great, just a great hero of mine, mentor. Funny story about Jack. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> going to the first retreat, we just started working together, didn't know much about each other. So we were sitting together on a bus going to the beach house of KSC, and he says, Mark, tell me a little about yourself. And I did. And he said, uh, what do you know about me? I said, well, sir, I know you're a general in the Marine Corps. That's pretty impressive. And he says, uh, do you know what the Marines are for? Well, I've assumed it's always kind of out of the British model projecting force at a distance. Kind of the, well, that's one thing, but you know what we're really for? No, protecting the captain from the crew. <laughs> and that was in the year of Dan Golden, <laughs> where there were a lot of, Dan was not very popular manager. So I thought that was always very funny. That was an example of Jack's dry sense of humor. And it's, you know, these other great phrases, he never been a rabbit pulled out of it that wouldn't put in there first. That's, I love Jack. So. We worked together on that. Came up, with, I'm very proud of the plan we came up with. for strategic enterprise, strategic management system. Actually, reorganized the agency around those and was headed down that path. And Dan left. The next administrator came in, didn't like it, so it changed. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, some of the, a lot of the material in my archive is around that period in the strategy and strategic management under Dan Golden and Jack Daly, and also under Sean O'Keefe, who took his place. Sean's approach to strategy was to come up with a vision and then implement that. And so I helped create that vision for him to a point, and some of that material's in there too, but mm -hmm. very different approaches to strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that's how I got interested in it, was seeing how it didn't work, we didn't really have one, seeing what could be done, and then uh, right. doing it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned at MIT, which is fascinating, was uh, defining what business you're in, how important that is. It sounds so simple. Well, yeah, I'm in the next business. The example they gave there, which really hit on me, was IBM. Uh, IBM really invented the computer, basically the big computer mainframes, and uh, did very, very well when everyone wanted a computer because everyone knew that's the future. Got to have a computer. Well, their one or two competitors showed up, and they said, well, our product's not a computer. Our, computer, our product is solutions. So they'd go to an airline and say, we know you're having this problem. We know how to solve it. Oh, by the way, you're going to need a computer. 
and they stole all the business from IBM. That simple reason. And that to me was kind of highlighted NASA in the office of space flight. Well, if you're in the space flight business, you know, so what? But if you're in the exploration development space, that is an articulation and a narrative people can understand. You can actually shape the enterprise around. And we were in danger of losing business because we were just in the space flight business. So that was one example that I'd learned in that. It was very important. Mm -hmm. it's, there are simple questions that are really very difficult and profoundly important if you understand what they are. Like what business are you in? And for whom, what value do you have? That's why value is a big part of my early years and thinking. What value do we provide to people? And not just value we provide because we say it. What do we actually shape, deliver it, and then say it? Mm -hmm. Step one and step two. Typically, I'd find we were in the business, well, value, that's PAO's problem. You know, We do what we're going to do as engineers. It's up to them to explain it. Who's PAO? Public affairs, I'm sorry. Right. In fact, I thinking back on it, at that time, I thought public affairs was the most hated organization in NASA. Because the NASA engineers, well, we don't get support because they don't explain it well enough. Well, maybe we're not doing it well enough. Maybe we're not doing the right things. Mm -hmm. It's not about explaining things. It's about doing things and then explaining them. So mm -hmm. that was another real eye-opener in that period of time for me. Mm -hmm. I've tried to carry forward since. Mm -hmm. And I produce pretty good at that for various reasons. That's, mm -hmm. If you look at the world in a bigger context, you'll see those kind of If you just get really narrow, focused in on your computer, your bolt, or your wheel, you won't. switch gears a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you mentioned Jack Daly. Yes. Are there others in your um, throughout your career in the space industry who were who were, had a positive impact? Oh on you? gosh, yeah. a mentor, a mentor. Yeah. Many, many people. Many, too, too many to mention. Actually, Jack's clearly way at the top of the list for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy Estes, the director at Stennis, that hired me there was his deputy. Was one also. Uh, Aaron Cohen at JSC. Um, those are the ones that come immediately to mind uh, for different reasons excuse me for different reasons too in different times in my life mm -hmm. one thing that uh, most of them tell me is the importance of a sense of humor and not taking yourself too seriously and if you really want to help people understand what you need to do you need to have a sense of humor in doing it and relate personally, not just kind of mm -hmm. do it and shut up and go away. That doesn't work very well. Right. And that's tough for engineers. I think in general, I don't want to generalize, but that's often tough for engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy Estes was a <laughs> fascinating a, a director of NASA's smallest center. Uh, he uh, had uh, Dan Golden loved him because Dan Golden, the New York Jew, thought Roy was completely different. Roy was a southern gentleman, kind of a guy from this, you know, Mississippi, Hayesburg, Mississippi. Thought it was a completely different alien life form, but he just loved him. And they worked well together uh, for that reason. And Roy had a great sense of humor and just loved by everyone because he really did listen to people. He really cared about people. And it was obvious he may not agree with you, but he didn't. He, he knew that he really cared and he'd listen to you and how important that is. Mm -hmm. Same with Jack Daly. Same with Aaron Cohen, actually. Mm -hmm. Listening. Listening. Again, like what business, it seems so simple, but it's not, and it's hard to do. And do it in a way people know that you're listening to. Mm -hmm. Don't count to or pan to them, but just listen. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that always amazed me about Eugene Cernan, is I always mm -hmm. felt mm -hmm. he was listening mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Even though he's, yeah. was Eugene Cernan, mm -hmm. <laughs> he listened. Listening to him. Well, Neil did that too, obviously. Mm -hmm. He would be one of my heroes too, and say, right. for that reason, listening. And, and not listening out of ignorance, but listening out of a real experience base that's, and this guy's really good, and they've done things. They know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about this already, but um, sustainability appears in, as a theme through mm -hmm. a lot of your later yeah. writings. Um, could you t talk a little bit more about that in terms of the future of space, of U.S. Mm -hmm. space okay. exploration, or maybe... You know, just space sure. exploration for humans. Well, it's and by sustainability, I mean enterprise sustainability, not uh, re recycling and other dimensions, which are important, but they're at a lower level. Enterprise sustainability is what do you do to make sure an enterprise thrives today and in the future and exists in the future? It's really an existential question. Um, I started in human spaceflight in Apollo, which was a very challenging and very different environment beat the Soviets to the moon. That was the environment. It was the mandate, the imperative. We all understood it. We all worked hard to make it happen. 
that's now gone through several revisions over time. Uh, we won the race, and thankfully then, and that's not, races are not sustainable, by the way, as an enterprise. You win or lose, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Been there, done that. That cliche takes over, which is very deadly for exploration in human space. Um, we won the race. We then had enough sense and guts to kind of, okay, now how do we get to space and use it? That was kind of the next layer of uh, narrative. Then as other countries develop capability, international capability, that was kind of the next layer. How do you, as other countries are developing for their own ends and purposes, how do we lead them by bringing them into this enterprise and help them and us in doing it both? International partnerships is the next layer. And I think the one now is exploring and developing space, where NASA's job is to explore space, but to do it in a way that can, do, that can enable and help commercial enterprises develop space mm -hmm. and then make use of that development to further the exploration. So it's an engine. Knowing full well the enterprise is then going to go off and develop markets completely away from NASA that are related to it, but not NASA itself. That's kind of the model of the engine. NASA explores space, but does it in a way that enables commercial development. Commercial development then then uses that commercial development to advance exploration while commercial development goes off and does adjacent markets. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful model. I think we're seeing it play out. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. It's very different. It's going to take from NASA a different approach, corporate work a different approach, investment a different approach, politics a different approach. But as we see it as a holistic enterprise and very important for the future, I think, of humankind, mm -hmm. it's a good enterprise to do. And, but it's going to take hard work. It's, it's the Apollo for this generation to me. It's so hard, but so important, and it's doable, and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I can see it in the eyes of the young people I talk to today. It's so exciting, and they're whatever they do, whether they're working for NASA, whether they're working in a company or somewhere, it's very exciting. So that's um, encouraging that you have so much hope. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The that's thing that'll kill it is people that think it's competition, that see it as we got to do this. It's uh, either as a country or as a company to, at the expense of others. Mm -hmm. Partnerships are not at the expense of others. They're win-win. Right. Needs to be win-win. So. They do. Yeah, they have to be win-win. Otherwise, it's not a partnership. It's a use case or something. Right. And they're not easy, but they're really important. And in space, they're extremely... I've lived it in my life, seen the power of them. Mm -hmm. The commercial world now is doing so many amazing things I never would have thought possible in my lifetime, but they're doing them, and it's amazing. How do we bring them into a national enterprise here that's... Uh, Sustainable, but exploring and developing. The government does what it does in a way that helps the commercial people do what they do. Then they then they help each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. It's it's really it's the new Apollo program. I think mm -hmm. it's that hard, that important. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to think about it that yeah, way. Yeah, I think so it's too. It's a different. Hard. It's very different. Very different hard. It's not. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you take the Apollo and use the same answers we got there because they won't right. work. The same procurement strategies. The same anything. Same right. politics. Nothing. It's different, but it's just as hard and just as cool and just as exciting and just as important, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think helping young people understand that, and that's why I'm very excited about your Lunar Initiative here, and I think that's going to help do that. And the students I talked to today, they, they can see it in their eyes. They get it. They're excited. That's why your enrollment's up, too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, that kind of leads into one of the, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask as we get towards the end here. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple more questions. When you address groups or students now about your experience or when someone reads your writings, what is the one message that you hope they'll take away with them if there was one thing? Well, one thing I think is very important, and I've tried to help our daughters understand this, and it's understand why. Mm -hmm. Why, why is it, as a company, as an enterprise, as a person, why do I do things, and how does that affect what I do? If it doesn't, it's not a real why. Mm -hmm. And part of that is understanding the context for things. Above you, below you, to the left and the right. If I'm an engineer, I'm designing a bolt. Well, what's above the, what's the bolt in? What's the bolt attached to? What's it next to? If I understand the context for the bolt, I'll do a better job of designing the bolt or whatever. And it'll help me grow as I understand the context for things. It'll help me do my job better now, and it'll help me grow to do it better in the future, whatever it is. That's sort of, sort of like understanding the big picture. It sense. is. Yeah, it is. And always keeping that in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and not being afraid of it. And sometimes it is. Sometimes I mean, there's a lot of dimensions oh. to that. Yeah. It is understanding it. It's not being afraid of it. It's seeing it as what it is, right. and it's a challenge, an opportunity, all that. It's scary. It's exciting. All that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like partnerships are so important. I mean, all that uh, is so important mm-hmm. as a challenge. Uh, and being open to other things too is so important. Not sharing you know the answer to everything because none of us know the answer to everything. Mm-hmm. None of us, thankfully. <laughs> That's why we need other people. That's why we need partnerships. Right. So in a word, I guess I'd say that's probably something like that. Mm-hmm. Great. So another question aimed at young students. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were applying for a position at NASA today or with a commercial mm-hmm. space company, how would you prefer? Prepare yourself knowing what you know from your experience and how perhaps space exploration is changing today. Well, in terms of preparation, I'd try to understand the bigger picture to a point. Mm-hmm. You can get too far down that road and understand a little picture at all, and that's not good either. But I think anyone that kind of understands the context from what they're doing is is stands uh, and can articulate it. Mm-hmm. That's very important. Being clear in one's articulation of something is very important. Understanding context is very important. Having values is very important mm-hmm. uh, today, anytime. What are my values? Why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I living my life the way I am? Why is that important? And to be able to articulate that in one's words and actions. So be able to articulate sort of your personal motivation mm-hmm. and your beliefs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And being open to new things, uh, not being afraid of things. Because as a student, you're, you're seeing some things, but you're not seeing everything by any stretch, and most students know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, showing your openness to, to, knowing, to, a, to knowing that and your openness to dealing with it is very important, I think, as an employer. Employers look for that. Because mm-hmm. they, they know you're going to encounter it, so how can you deal with it? Mm-hmm. Are you good with other people? Do you listen? Can you think clearly? Uh, very important. How do you, where do you get your information? It's also very important, I think. Um, one of the one of my other favorite stories years ago was uh, in the in the early Moon Mars days because we my staff and I concluded the real challenge wasn't technical, it was political. As I said, architecture is nice, but why are we doing this? And how do we make it politically viable? So we decided to conduct a use a university to conduct a survey on kind of a scientific literacy survey. You know. Where are people today? Because if you're going to really address people and engage them, you have to understand where they are. Not where you wish they were or hope they were. Where are they? We did a big survey, I think it was Stanford. And uh, one of the questions I remember was asked, I'll never forget, does the earth go around the moon? Does the moon go around the earth? Or I don't know. To voting adults. This was a survey to voting adults in America. Two-thirds did not get the right answer. So a third didn't know, a third thought that someone around the earth, and a third thought the earth went around the sun. Now, does that make its difference in and of itself? No. But what else don't they know? That's what stuck with me. How many branches of government there are? Is there a king in America? I mean, I just, that is. Another another story, kind of thinking of that one, I had a young person work for me when I was, uh, oh, in the late 70s, senior engineer. Young person went to great American, a good engineer, went to great American university, had never heard of Hitler. How does that happen? I mean, I got to think, how did I learn it? I don't know, but I did. I mean, so things like that, public education to help people mm-hmm. understand the world in which they live is really important. Mm-hmm. Those things have come back to haunt me lately. I mean, just those two memories, gee, mm-hmm. how can you not know the sun, the earth, and Hitler? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, in your own world, I guess. Yeah. Being open to so somehow being open to things. Yeah. And, and and looking for things to learn, being open to learning is key, I think. Mm-hmm. I know as an employer, I sure look for that. Mm-hmm. Somebody walked in, I know this and I know that. You go, oh, I don't need you. So I think you, as a young person, A, it's important for your life and your skills and your society. But it's important to convey that to others, too, that how important it is and help them understand it, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good My last question, Mark. Is there anything I haven't asked you about today that you wish <laughs> that you wished I had asked you about? Although there's a 
a multitude uh, of things I could have asked, but that's a great question. No, I don't. Time. I don't think so. I think that's uh, you've hit on the points I'd like to. My my prayer for this archive of fifty years of experience is to be useful to the people and the enterprise in it. That's my only prayer. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful that the archive is. You're helping it, organizing it, controlling it, managing it, making it available, and using it to teach, because mm -hmm. it's not worth anything. It's not teaching. And it, I'd, I'd like to think there's enough here to help people at least see what we've done in the past and the mistakes we've made and the things that we've done well and learn from them. And that's so, again, as we said, that's so important to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, part of the context is the history of things. Not an assumed history, but what really happened? Mm -hmm. What did people try? What didn't work? Why didn't it work? Right. What did they think it didn't work? Mm -hmm. And I, my prayer is that this archive can help with that in so many different areas, technical areas, but mainly political right. and communication areas. Uh, some of the people I'd, you know, that I've been fortunate enough to know here, uh, like the Disney Lake people, have such great. That might be another thing I'd say. I guess there are a lot of really smart people that have a lot of different skills in a lot of different domains in life. Don't ever assume your domain has all the answers. Ever, you're making a huge mistake. Uh, I was president of the American Astronautical Society, and for years I'd go to the, our big conferences and many others, and get so tired of the same people say the same thing. So. 2009, we organized a big conference in Houston called Imagine 09. And our, our idea was to make kind of like a TED conference where we'd just invite people with no apparent relationship to space at all. But I, I felt they had something to tell us. Mm -hmm. So we invited Joe Rohde, the Disney executive who created Animal Kingdom. Betty Sue Flowers, the producer of Joe Campbell's series on myth. I mean, and the things they said, and Bob Rogers, who's my friend who runs the entertainment themed attraction business, branding business. The things they said are profound from very different domains, but are profound. And to us to continue to go back, I go back to them and I look at them again, I still learn things from them. Mm -hmm. They jog thoughts, they make me, why am I? That's very important. I'd say, you know, always look for things outside your, certainly your, your comfort zone, but certainly your domain too. Uh, Right, so outside of your the area, the career that you're working yep. in, don't stay just in nope. your own professional organization and those people. But well, look, people look for ideas. Under. Yeah, there are a lot of people doing a lot of things you'd be shocked at in the world that are that are applicable. Yeah. But it takes some work to find out how they're applicable and then to use right. it. But they are profoundly applicable. I'll guarantee you. Yeah. yeah it takes work. That's a wonderful point. Mm. Well, and I'd invite the, the the people that I just mentioned in my YouTube thing. I think in the archive, I put the CDs and the YouTube addresses of some of those presentations. Take a look at those. You want to see some different thinking. Mm -hmm. And tell me that's not effective and profound. Mm -hmm. and doesn't have an effect on whatever you're doing, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting. It's not f scary, I don't think, or fearful. It's exciting to find people that are doing those kind of things. Learn from them. Right. Figure out how to translate it into what your enterprise is and what your values are. It's really, I've learned and grown so much from that and so much value there. Friendship and effort to do that. Yeah, that's great advice, I think. It makes me a better person, I'd like to think. It's certainly more interesting to myself, anyway. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. Thank Tracy. you for placing your papers with Purdue. Well, We're well, honored. I wouldn't have any other place. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. I really am. Fantastic. I brag on you all the time to people. Oh. What you're doing. Try to get other folks getting their material here, too. So. Yeah. Well, we are very grateful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.